Hello, my name is Dan Sadarsky, North Central Section Representative of the Wildlife Society and Chair of the Celebrating Our Wildlife Conservation Heritage Project of the Society. We use the acronym COUCH Project for short. This is an effort to document the history of the wildlife profession, to examine and, and celebrate our roots through the eyes and memories of, of those who have lived and shaped it. Well, first a bit of background. The professional field of wildlife management and conservation began in the 1930s with Aldo Leopold's publication of Game Management and the subsequent founding of a Department of Game Management at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Many of the first generation of wildlife professionals have passed away, several key individuals in 1999. It's imperative that the thoughts, recollections, and impressions of the individuals who played key roles in the evolution of the wildlife profession be captured and preserved before they are lost forever. In 1999, the Wildlife Society adopted the Couch Project to accomplish this goal through the use of video and or audio taped interviews of these living historians. Well, how will it work? The Couch Project will be carried out at the State Wildlife Society chapter level with coordination from Wildlife Society ch section representatives. Each chapter will have a couch coordinator and perhaps a small committee who will identify key people to interview and facilitate the interviews. Interviewees could include charter members of the Wildlife Society, Leopold Medal winners, past presidents of the Wildlife Society, people who have received a noteworthy chapter and section representative, uh, and others who state chapter members feel have made noteworthy contributions to wildlife conservation in their state or region. For the present, tapes will be archived at the national headquarters of the Wildlife Society with copies to people interviewed and the State Wildlife Society chapter. In the future, these historical materials could become part of a National Center for Wildlife Conservation type repository. They also will be available for historical research, documentary films, and other educational uses. This program that you're about to see will give you an overview of how to conduct an interview and we gratefully acknowledge the assistance of Mark Madison of the National Conservation Training Center of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and in particular their oral history project. You will see in this program film clips from a two-hour interview done by myself and John Moriarty, the historian of the Minnesota chapter of the Wildlife Society. We interviewed Art and Betty Hawkins on June 17, 2000 at their uh, home near Hugo, Minnesota, which is north of St. Paul. Art is a charter member of the Wildlife Society, Leopold graduate student, and pioneering waterfowl biologist. Well, how do you prepare for the interview? The success of an interview depends upon the preparation of two people, the interviewer and the narrator. Contact the narrator prior to the interview and give them a copy of the guide sheet so they know what to expect. The interviewer should describe the Crouch Project to the narrator and state how the narrator's career is important to the project. Therefore, the interviewer will need to know something about the person and their accomplishments. Become familiar with the general questions list, which is enclosed in the uh, pamphlet. Uh, for also, for each person, uh, find out from them if they would like you to ask specific questions uh, before the interview. Well, now let's go through a pre-interview checklist. Number one, use a good quality video camera, preferably digital, mounted on a tripod. If using an audio recorder instead of, and in addition to, also use high quality uh, equipment. If available, an external microphone is generally better than an internal one. Lapel microphones could work well, but attach inconspicuously. Have a notebook handy to record questions that occur to you during the interview and have spare batteries, tapes, and an extension cord. I have a three-prong to two-prong adapter to accommodate outlets in an older home because you may encounter some of those. But whatever equipment is used, make sure you familiarize yourself with it ahead of time. Well, uh, on to the interview. Uh, also key to a successful interview is the right setting. Uh, make sure the narrator feels at ease and, and pick a quiet location such as a living room or den. Uh, have the narrator sit in their favorite chair if possible. The uh, interviewer and narrator could both be seated in comfortable chairs uh, facing a coffee table. That might be one desirable setting. 
The camera could include both the interviewer and the narrator initially if a third person is operating the camera, and I would recommend that if that is possible, but should, should then zoom in on the narrator as the uh, interview progresses. Uh, make sure the lighting is appropriate. Uh, good artificial light is really better than natural light coming through windows because that may create some shadows. An extra light source may be needed in, uh, in those circumstances. You should minimize distracting noises, uh, avoid air conditioners, heaters, fans, TVs, radios, other appliances that make a lot of background noise. Uh, suggest disconnecting the phone if that would be possible because any noise will be amplified on the tape. Uh, close windows and doors if uh, you're taping near a highway because it will pick up background noise as we uh, experienced when we did this interview. Uh, a good interview is more monologue than dialogue. The interviewer should be attentive, courteous, and responsive, but remain largely silent in the course of the interview. Uh, allow the, inter the narrator time to think or collect thoughts. If there's an obvious break, uh, ask a question from the list or clarify points from notes taken earlier in the interview. And importantly, have fun with the interview. After all, this is a celebration of the wildlife profession. And now let's look at some scenes from the interview. This is an interview with Art Hawkins on 17 June 2000 as part of the, I get the right term here, celebrating our wildlife heritage, wildlife conservation heritage project. Art, I guess, I'd like to start with just some, some background on kind of your personal history as far as where you were born, you know, when, where you grew up, some information on that sort? Well, I was, uh, I was born in Batavia, New York, um, which is between Buffalo and Rochester. Uh, and um, actually, my birthday was only two days ago, June 15th, 1913. Uh, my parents, um, names were same as mine, Arthur, it was my dad, and my mother's name was Olive, her last name was Prescott. Um, they, my dad was born in England, and he came over to this country when he was about eight years old, and um, uh, promptly settled in, uh, at Batavia, I believe it was. Uh, one of the uh, important things that happened to me as a, as a newsboy, uh, one of my customers was um, turned out to be a, a, a typical little old lady in tennis shoes type of birder. And uh, uh, so we, whenever I'd go there for collecting for the paper or something, uh, she'd get out her bird book and, uh, and uh, tell me about birds. And I got interested in it. And, uh, and uh, she told me that the, what to get as a bird guide, which is one of these pocket-sized reed bird guides. and. Uh, I remember my mother uh, got me a pair of uh, binoculars uh, to start out with my birding. Only they weren't—I uh, they, think they were two two power uh, opera glasses. I think was what, what they were to start with. Uh, but uh, I recall that I I got into a, a, a migration of warblers one time, and by that time I had my two powers in my bird book, and. Uh, uh, it was uh, one of these uh, migrations where you get a whole lot of warblers in one tree at one time. And I remember just uh, uh, standing there looking through my bird book, identifying these warblers. And I, I think I must have learned uh, at least a half a dozen or so on that very first trip. And that got me kind of uh, into, into birding in a big way because I, I had, uh, hadn't realized that um, birds were that pretty, I guess. And, uh, so that, that uh, really, she really got me started in my interest in, uh, in songbirds. Is that's when I was, uh, I was interested in some sort of a career that would take you out of doors. And uh, forestry was the one that uh, sounded uh, like the best bet. So I uh, went to Cornell because they had a forestry school there. And um, um, one of the requirements was that you spend the summer, the first summer, in some sort of a, 
a job related to forestry or outdoors of some sort. At that time, because of the deep depression, uh, these, these even summer jobs were hard to come by. And uh, the, the only place I could get located was a, a local uh, game club that had a place where they raised trout and planted trees and uh, things of that sort. And uh, so I, I uh, I worked there most of the summer, uh, feeding liver to trout and doing some stream improvement work and uh, uh, planting quite a number of trees. Uh, uh, anyway, that was, uh, but I, I didn't get, uh, they couldn't afford to pay me anything, and uh, but I needed to do that to get my credit for summer work. And uh, But at the end of it, they, uh, uh, they Gave me, uh, presented me with an Ithaca shotgun, so that was my summer's pay for for working for them. Long toward the end of the first semester, uh, I was called into um, Dr. Allen's office. He was the ornithologist office that I'd done a lot of work under, and he said that there are two two openings that have just come to, come to me that, uh, and I thought you might be interested in one of them. And um, uh, one was to go to Wisconsin to study under Aldo Leopold, and uh, the other was to work for the Audubon Society uh, on uh, Ivory Bell Woodpecker. And um, there were two of us that he called into the office, and the, the other fellow was ahead of me, and that he uh, had been working on his PhD. And uh, his name was Jim Tanner, and um, and he was uh, he was a died in the world ornithologist. I mean, he was an old. Type, uh, really into ornithology in a big way, and he he chose the uh, ivory bill job, and that left the other open to me, so I applied for the second one, which was going to Wisconsin under Leopold. And uh, at that point, I think I had heard of Leopold, but I had no idea anything about him. But anyway, it sounded like it was uh, along the lines that I was interested in getting into. A game work, and uh, so anyway, I, I just took a flyer at it and went out there, and uh, so became Leopold's third student. He already had uh, uh, a fellow named Leonard Wing, and uh, uh, and Franklin Schmidt. When we um, moved to these outposts like Shepherd Field and um, and Amarillo. Uh, and Betty was allowed to to go with me on these army assignments, and um, so the first person we'd go to would be the local game warden, and he figured he'd know more about uh, the, um, uh, the country around there and the wildlife problems and things like that. And this was a this turned out to be a, the best thing we ever did. Is uh, the uh, Gave us in to these ranches, which are uh, which, which are hard to get into in in Texas. Uh, the uh, uh, but with uh, traveling with the game warden on weekends when I had when I was off duty, uh, I got to see an awful lot of of Texas from that standpoint and be able to hunt and fish on places I ordinarily wouldn't have had access to and, and see places. And uh, anyway, that. Uh, does that kind of summarize? Well, it doesn't tell about when we got when we got married. Uh, it was uh, uh, mentioned that Betty Betty was uh, uh, her grandfather was the person who kind of organized Sable Grove, and uh, so I got acquainted with her there, and uh, and uh, we, we got married out at uh, Crawfish Prairie, which was uh, uh, an area. Uh, it was part of the Fable Grove area. Uh, it was a native wet prairie, and um, at that time it was uh, one of the finest wet prairies in Wisconsin. Max Parch did, did uh, a lot of his work there. He had a long stretch of 50 years that he spent gathered data on this one prairie. And I didn't know them well. Uh, Professor Leopold came out to Fable Grove sometimes to see his students, and when he did, he often had dinner at noon with us, and we all had him around the table with us, and that was 
especially nice because he was so nice to have for company. That's a whiskey survey at that time. So I, uh, that was the point in which I joined the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, and uh, I could be stationed at Madison, which was another plus. And Aldi Leopold had offered office uh, space for free if, uh, if I had office with him. So in exchange for that, I would uh, uh, take his classes occasionally uh, when he was called away or something of that nature and, uh, and work with some of his uh, grad students that were working with waterfowl. And uh, so it was a, a really a nice arrangement. And then almost immediately uh, we uh, went to Canada where I was uh, uh, worked on uh, the activities up there, the, uh, the surveys that uh, for waterfall numbers and uh, and then later with the banding and that sort of thing. And so uh, Betty and, uh, let's see, we didn't have any family yet, did we? Oh yeah, we had tech, techs by that time. So we all bundled up uh, about uh, within a week or two after I joined the service and we took off for Canada. And uh, from then on we spent um, eight years in a row uh, based at Delta and uh, uh, and then I worked out of there over most of in Manitoba although at times I worked the whole prairie area. Chickens, that was one of our activities when I was manager of the area was to uh, set up a chicken blind out there and then take people, uh, groups out and most of the local farmers had never they'd heard them all their lives you know and they'd never seen the the activities and um, and that, this became a very popular thing around there. All the we take out groups in the early in the morning and uh, to the booming ground and uh, and that was uh, uh, that was one thing that kind of brought the farmers and others together too. You know, and the, and the sportsmen. Uh, after the interview, uh, first thing you should do is remove tapes on uh, the tabs on the tapes to prevent over taping because you wouldn't want to destroy a, uh, a good program. Uh, label the tapes and complete the interview report which is contained in the handout. Uh, have the narrator sign the gift and release agreement. This is part of uh, copyright uh, procedures. And then send the completed uh, forms and the tapes to the Wildlife Society and that address is, uh, is in the packet. I hope this program gives you enough background to uh, get started recording the fascinating history of the wildlife profession. Uh, don't worry if it isn't perfect. A uh, few of us are Tom Brokow. But I guarantee you that you will personally be enriched and wildlife of, of the future will be grateful indeed that you made it possible for them to enjoy these wildlife historians. Thank you and have fun. Well, one of the uh, important things that happened to me as a, as a newsboy, um, one of my customers was uh, turned out to be a, a, a typical little old lady in Tennessee.